Welcome to Stockton Memories. We're going to be looking at about 200 slides in total of the over 45,000 we have in the archive collection. Um, I'm being joined today by five long-time Stockton aficionados, and I want to introduce each of them. This is kind of like the cooking show where you say, here's this person, and this is the, all the restaurants they own, and all of the food they prepared, and the employees they have. So uh, you need to know who these lovely people are. And we're going to start with Bruce Mitchell. He uh, started attending camp in 1952 as a teenager with his mother. He quickly became a member of the staff as the assistant to the director, Lawton Harris. He later joined the board. He became the third director and served for 20 plus years. And he's now still on the board and pretty much in charge of the Stockton Library and getting it digitized. <laughs> and next we have Bob Harris. He is the son of the founder, Lawton Harris. He attended at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 10 or 11 in 1952. Uh, missed a few years when he went to graduate school, came back and has been here ever since. An excellent musician. You'll see a lot of pictures of him on his bass. Next, we have Denise Heenan. She started attending in 1969, I'm going to guess. Um, has attended every year since then. She was on the board. She's not on the board anymore, but she now uh, runs the auctions and the lawn parties. And she has run the lawn parties for years and knows where all the bodies are buried, I understand. And we have Gordon Deeg, who is the current director. Uh, this is in 1961 when he started attending. He hasn't missed a camp since then. So what, 45, 50 years, something like that. Um, he's the current director. He was on the staff. He was a board member for many years and they finally got him to be the director. And we have Cameron McKnight, uh, started attending in the mid seventies as a teenager. So she's already put in 40 years plus and still going strong. She is the editor of the footnotes that comes out at camp every year, keeps Gordon in line. She's also a board member. So we're going to start with the early years and uh, the emphasis is on the teachers who made Stockton what it was, starting with Lawton Harris and Sally Harris, the founders. And as I said, Bob was their son and was probably six years old when camp started. How did camp come about? Uh, there were two years that there was a shorter duration institute. I believe it was at Mills College in East Bay in 48. My father had been on the faculty at Pacific for about four years. He had the idea of bringing that institute to Stockton and enlarging it. So camp came into existence in 48. Um, he had been a recreation specialist, not so much an ethnic dancer, but training at the college. He was training future Boy Scout leaders, campfire girls, church recreation specialists. And really camp it was an outgrowth of that uh, professional involvement as much as the ethnic dance world. He'd been teaching dances for a long time. Mother would play the piano in lieu of records and uh, they would dance to live music when they danced in the, a lot of them were in the Methodist churches. Those were the camps that, that they did in the summer. And dancing was in those days, it was for, forbidden. So they were teaching folk games. So we were playing games at camp. The first couple of years, it was actually part of the summer school curriculum. And you had to go and register for the class, just like everybody else did. And it was pretty terrifying to have to get in, with, get in line with all the other hundreds of thousands of students that were trying to register for class. So, uh, Bruce, what brought you to camp? What brought me to camp? Well, my mother was dancing. <laughs> His <So> mother. <laughs> she would come home, she would be at folk dance camp, she'd come home and teach me a dance, she'd learn folk dance camp. And so, in fact, 1951, I went with her, and uh, Rivka Sturman had been there, and we did uh, one of her dances. That's the only dance I knew at that time. 52 was my first year actually being at folk dance camp. So that was a, a real, you know, the beginning, shall we say. So would you say thing. you were, would you say you were dragged by the ear by your mother or did you no, go willingly? No, I was not. I, I was into dance by that time. I, because I started dancing very short before that when my folks were square dancing and I went to a square dance with them 
and there was one man short of having five full squared, or so I stood up and never sat down after that. First four years, I was shipped off to a place up north of Wairika, almost on the Oregon border. And I guess by the fourth camp, fifth camp, they figured I was old enough to not be too much of an embarrassment. But uh, it was just something you heard about at the dinner table year round. And so it was exciting to be able to come that first year. You had your bicycle then, Bob. At first, I got my first bicycle at camp. John Filsich brought it out. Well, I started uh, dancing uh, as a teenager at a, uh, a junior high school in Sacramento. There were actually three uh, teenage dance groups going on concurrently at this uh, uh, school. And uh, so I was dancing. I always heard about uh, folk dance camp. And this was in the uh, mid-50s. And... Uh, Later on, in about 57, or I think 1958, I was dancing with a, a one, one group there, and uh, uh, the teacher there said that she would do recommend people to go to a folk dance camp on a scholarship. So I went up to her and I says, well, I'd like to go, and uh, can you do a scholarship? And she said, you know, you're not going to stick with it. You won't, you won't be doing it, so I don't think that would be a good investment, so uh, I'm not going to recommend you. So I quit dancing with her and went started dancing with uh, uh, Bruce, and uh, again, I knew he was involved with folk dance camp. So in 61, I managed to cobble enough money together to uh, pay me my way to camp, and so that was my first year, and... Um, uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, 62, I didn't make it to camp because I was in the military. I was uh, spending my time in lovely Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, then from 63 on, uh, pretty much every year I've been at camp. Um, 1969 was my first year at Stockton Folk Dance Camp. I had gone back to school to get my teaching credential and found a recreational class at San Jose State taught by Ned and Marion Galt, and then enrolled in the class on campus. And there was on one of the bulletin boards was a flyer about Stockton. And I went, that sounds like fun. So I signed up and I got the bug and I still have it. It's been great. Oh no, I went by myself the first couple of years. There were a couple of us uh, teenagers who went kind of unaccompanied, but uh, we had people watching over us. Uh, my parents uh, danced in then Marion's uh, exhibition group from the beginning, and I've been dancing with them <coughs> since I was really little. And I had always, basically, once I found out about camp, had wanted to go, but I was never able to because my parents weren't going. And finally, Ned Marion helped me, and I got to come, and um, it was great, and uh, been coming ever since. I was the first one in my family to go. Uh, my sister eventually started coming, and then my mom and, and Georgia Milton used to come. Um, so it kind of became a family thing after that. Uh, I kind of gave them the bug, I think. But yeah. They were, the camp, they were the camp photographers, you and they. The, the three of you kind of were the camp photographers for many years. Yeah, my mom and Georgia especially, but yeah. Well, I have many pictures of you taking pictures of them, so I know you were taking a lot of those pictures. It wasn't just them. I think For every one years, of us you know. met our spouse at camp. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I met uh, Cameron at camp or at uh, the dance club in uh, San Jose. It's a better story. Go with it. Oh, okay. Either, <laughs> either one. But I would have been younger then. <laughs> Yeah, so I started more than willingly. <laughs> How did you wind up at camp? Well, again, I had heard about it for years, and people had suggested and suggested, and you should, and I always had something else going on in my life. Next year I'll go, next year I'll go, next year I'll go. I started dancing in 71, and it wasn't until 92 that I finally got to camp. Um, and primarily it was because Israel Yacobi was invited to attend, and... He wanted somebody there that he knew. So he, I don't know, probably wrote to me, maybe called me. Somebody, somebody said, you need to come and kind of be Israel's 
helper, be his assistant for the week. And I said, oh, all right, I guess so. And I just loved it. It was like everything I'd ever dreamed of, and I've been back ever since. And I think I came the first, maybe I have to check my card. I, I, only, I could only afford one week for a couple of years, but eventually I became a, every year, two weeks, can't live without it. <laughs> and then I started on the syllabus and, you know, every, gradually you just become more and more involved. So you can't leave. You're uh, embedded in the structure. So that if you leave, you're afraid that the bricks will fall off the, the edge of the house if you, if you leave. Yeah, so, you can't leave. This is the first year of camp. It's the only picture we have from 1948. And this isn't even everybody, because I know there are people that did attend that year and they're not in this group photo. But this is a pretty impressive crowd. Um, you'll notice that everybody, all the women are wearing skirts and almost all of them have, well, most of them have, they have at least a sleeve because the sleeveless and halter tops were not allowed, nor were uh, shorts of any kind for men or women. So everybody had to be pretty well dressed up from that heat of Stockton. And I'm going to zoom in just a minute here to see Lawton and Sally Harris over here. This is Lawton and Sally Harris. There are but a few other people which I'll show you later, but this is just to show you what 1948 looked like. Uh, this photograph was not taken by Ace Smith, who took the bulk of the photographs you're going to see today, because he happens to be in this photograph. Um, this is the 1949 picture, and I'm going to zoom in again on this one as well, because you can't see quite how far back this crowd goes. You look here, there's people standing in the shadows. This is a very deep bunch of people here. So this is in the year later, 1949. This is the cost of camp in 1951. $17.50 would get you per person per period. So it wasn't quite, that's the, what everybody had to pay. And this was uh, some of the staff members and we'll be talking about them soon. This was 1952 when both Bob down here in this lower circle, he was attending for the first time. And here's Bruce up here with his mom. And two other people that would eventually uh, attend every year until they died, Larry Miller and Ed Kremers. Ed Kremers is one of the vendors who sold um, records later cassette tapes. I don't know whether he lived long enough to do CDs, but he was around for a very long time. He was a square dance caller and a folk dance teacher, and that was in 1952. And again, a lot of the people that uh, would eventually become famous in Stockton are in this picture, but I'm not going to go into them right now. Ace Smith is the guy that I'll show you pictures of in just a minute. This is the main photographer that we had. And this is, he, there aren't very many pictures of him because he was almost always behind the camera. So this was Ace Smith, his wife, Marge. Uh, Ace was always a hobby photographer, and he took pictures on pictures on pictures. And uh, he had a camera with a delay. So he got in, into a lot of his, his own pictures. But he would shoot several hundred pictures during camp. And the better ones were posted on a board where people could order them. And after camp, he would be printing pictures and Marge would making sure it stayed organized and the pictures got to the right place. He cataloged them? He put them into folders? Uh, not at that point, I don't think. Once camp was over, probably they got dumped in, in one place. But uh, the real cataloging of the thousands that you have now probably was a project of Marge's. When I got the box from the, art, from the storage unit, it was literally two large cardboard boxes labeled by year or by category. So there's one that was just the committee, there was one that was just the teachers, one that was just the staff, but very well organized. I, some of the time, I think nobody could figure out when exactly a picture was taken, so they put multiple copies. So I sometimes ran into the same photograph in the same set, series of folders. But that's Ace and his cameras. And he was very close to being on the very first camp committee, planning committee as well. Yeah, he did come. He was eventually on it very early, though. Not the first <laughs> one, but he was on there very early. You saw the picture with the uh, two cameras. 
So all the black and white pictures were taken with a, a twin lens uh, reflex. And then all the slides, he would take slides, and those were always done with a 35. So that was the two cameras he always had and was always taking pictures. So um, the people that, in the, starting in the, the early years, either in, in 48 when the first camp came along or within the first few years, there were people that were instrumental in creating the atmosphere of camp. And I think, Bob, you said they were almost all from California? Most of them, yeah. They were the teaching faculty, the great majority was from the Bay Area. And they were most of the time teaching dances with which they were familiar, but not the kind of thing that were either big exhibition dances or uh, things that they had done special research. There are a couple of exceptions, but uh, they were building a reper standard repertoire of dances that were danced around at least Northern California, if not beyond. And when did they start having people coming in from outside the Bay Area? Well, I know in that first that picture with me as a 10 year old, uh, Paul and Gretel Dunsing, I noticed in that picture, they were German experts that came from, from the East Coast. Um, and by the early 50s, not as many foreign teachers as we've had in more recent years, but there were a couple of headliners that were unique draws. Okay, so some of those people that were at camp every year for many, many years, uh, this is Walter Grothe. He taught for 22 years, starting with either the first or the second camp. He always had a pipe. This is one of the few times when I don't see him with a pipe. Uh, this is Vera Holifer. She was a, primarily a square dance caller, and she eventually served on the board. Um, Buzz Glass, his real name was Henry Glass, but he was known as Buzz Glass. He taught for 16 years, lived in the Bay Area. Uh, Lucille Charnowski taught for 13 years, beginning in the very first year. And I'm going to show, this is the picture that I showed you at the beginning, and I want to show you these particular people we just talked about. So here's Walter Grothe. There's Buzz Glass, Lucille Charnowski. And over here, Vera Holifer. And just for good measure, there's Ace, because I know he was in that first year. He wasn't a teacher, but he was there the first year. So let's talk about these guys. Well, Walter was, of course, the perpetual lawn party person for many, 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 many years. And uh, he always taught Austrian dance when he did teach. That was his specialty. He used to drive a, a Mercedes 300 SL Roadster. Uh, to camp, and uh, those are probably my most desired car in the world, but you know, now they go for about $1.7 million or so. Uh, but uh, one year he showed up and he didn't have it anymore. And I says, Walter, what happened to your car? He says, well, I sold it. I said, why would you do that? And he said, well, I don't need it anymore. I, I got married, so I don't need it. I said, well, how much did you get for it? He says, $4,000. And uh, just think if uh, somebody had hung on the, onto that car. It was a beautiful car. I loved it. And evidently quite a chick magnet. Uh, well, <laughs> at least one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it was worth it. And Vera Holifer, Denise, you, liked, you were fond of Vera. Vera had the voice of an angel. She used to narrate the slides. We always had a slideshow before the assemblies, and Vera was the one who narrated the slides and would identify who everyone was, and she, she was a lovely person. We still miss her. And having been there since the, you know, the very first camp, she knew everybody. It wasn't a, a coincidence. She didn't have to do any research like I do, because I didn't <laughs> know these people before I saw their pictures, but she knew them personally. She knew who all the people were. Buzz Glass, first president of the Federation which was taken, that took place in Lodi, that ceremony, that very first president and was you know, inaugurated into the presidency on, in Lodi. And I understand the, uh, he about, he, uh, his, the secretary eventually became his wife, which I thought was a pretty cagey deal. I'll make you a secretary if you'll marry me. <laughs> <laughs> but I have some lovely pictures of the two of them when they came to camp for one of the anniversaries. He was around a very long time. It is early years, he was, when he went to college, he was a pole vaulter on the Cal track team. 
Oh. Pole vault. Okay. Back when they had pool poles that didn't bend. And Lucille, she's got a book in her hand. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Dances of Early California Days. Yeah, Dances of Early California. Uh, she was a grand person unto herself, instructor at UC, and uh, just a grand person to know, and just always very regal. And all the years I knew her, and at camp as well. I don't think I've ever seen a picture of her without pearls. <laughs> she researched the, the early California dances. It was not something she'd grown up with or part of her heritage. She took it on as, as a project that she thought needed to be done. Okay, going on to later in the 50s, these are people that did not start with the first camp, but they, they did play a big role in the first decade or two. Um, Anatole Joukowsky, I have many, many, you're going to have many stories about him in just a minute. He taught for 18 years at Stockton. This is another picture of him with his signature headscarf. Jack McKay, who would eventually be the second director, uh, he taught for 14 years. Madeline Green taught for 18 years, according to my notes. Um, quite a character. She had, I believe, her own camp as well as coming to Stockton. She had a studio in the city. She, according to my notes, died shortly after having a heart attack in her dance class at a very young age compared to all of us. She was in her sixth and Let's Dance Magazine devoted an entire issue to her. John Filsich pretty much brought Kolos and the dances of the former state of Yugoslavia to Stockton. He taught for 17 years and still comes to camp. Miriam Lister taught for 13 years. A generalist, I think she was at Stanford. Uh, Grace Perryman Nichols taught for 16 years. These are a class with her, the Gracie's Cricket. She taught castanets because it was an important part of the, the dance form she taught. And Ralph Page, Contras, and he was, he was quite a character. We have lots of photographs of him, but we'll talk about those at the end of this little presentation. Let me go back here and let's talk about some of these people that played an important part here. So, uh, Bruce, you, had an all, you wrote an entire article about Anatole. Anatole... Uh course, escaped from Yugoslavia and, and, uh, and before came over eventually ended up in San Francisco and ended up at one of the uh, Federation festivals being held in the auditorium and uh, was discovered there and brought to folk dance camp in the early 50s and became a stalwart teacher there for only just one year and all the years, you know, until 1972. You can see wearing a scout neckerchief, which he did, he was very much involved in the Boy Scouts. And he oftentimes wore that neckerchief when he taught. We had an interesting story with Anatole. Uh, had a dance group that was wanting to learn a Peridian dance. We went to Yanya's uh, dance studio in Palo Alto, beautiful wooden floor. And the men's dance was a sick dance. We had no sticks. So we went around and found a pole, just a, you know, not a pole, but a, a piece of pipe. And so he demonstrated to us how the guys were to do the jumps. Gordon was there right along with us trying to learn that dance. And of course, the bad part about it was every time you put the pipe down, it gouged the wooden floor. To this day, I'd like to know what Yanya had to say to Anatole about the floor. His last dance he taught to us in 1972 because he decided to just go in to study American Indian dance was an American Indian dance. <laughs> And he was known as Mr. J. Yeah, that's correct. Well, well, it's kind of like Martha Objevitz is known as Martha A, because <laughs> nobody can pronounce Objevitz. Yeah. So Joukowsky One, seemed to, to stick on people's met tongue so that he became Dr. J instead. I was just going to enlarge on what Bruce had said with his connection with scouts. When uh, he was first came on faculty when my father was still alive, and... He invited him to, to come to Stockton, and he was happy to do so, but on one condition, which was that he would not have to be in Stockton on Tuesday night. No teaching. 
And of course, it was a little unusual. Dad asked why. And he said, that's the night that my Boy Scout troop meets, and I don't miss their meeting. So he had Tuesday nights off as long as he was here. Yeah, a lot of our teachers got special deals, which we'll talk about too in a minute. <clears throat> One more story about Anatole. Oh. The Methodist College was very strong when folk dance camp started back in 1948 and had very strict rules. One of the rules being no liquor on campus. However, Mr. J always had a bottle in his room. He'd invite two or three people, not a big party, small group into his room to share a drink. And Lawton never said a word to him about it, ever. Not in all the years he was there. I, I always think had that bottle with him. Yeah, I Lawton think was that, never uh, invited. Lawton, <laughs> I, I think Lawton uh, conveniently overlooked several indiscretions uh, by the teachers. Uh, he, he had uh, a pretty good set of blinders on. So, <laughs> and by the way, Anatole, his primary profession was ballet. Yeah. So when you saw the picture mm -hmm. of him there, uh, you can see the uh, character ballet. And he was, I believe, the premier uh, choreographer for the Belgrade uh, uh, Ballet Company between the World Wars. And. Um, also, it's my understanding that he uh, fought for the Yugoslav uh, underground during World War II, was captured twice by the Nazis, and twice escaped. So, uh, quite, quite a character, quite a history. Elsie Dunan said that Macedonia finally recognized Anatole and his dance accomplishments in their country. Yeah. It took many, many years after, afterwards before that happened. As far as directors overlooking little indiscretions, I would, I would say that all of our directors have had that ability. Uh, yeah, you need blinders. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jack no. McKay, 14 years, he would eventually become our second director. Go, Jack go ahead, became Bob. director under difficult circumstances. My father died in mid-June before the 20th anniversary camp, and... The project was, a lot of it was in more in his, my father's head than it was in notes. And Jack had to basically put that first camp that he was in charge of together in about five, six weeks. Yeah, I, I remember Jack uh, very well, very organized, walked around with a, a clipboard uh, with a notepad on it. So, you, you know, he always had a clipboard and he'd be writing down different stuff. Uh, one thing that uh, I remember about uh, Jack the best was, and uh, in, in those days I was in charge of grounds and uh, keeping track of everything. And after camp, after everybody would leave, it would be uh, just Jack and myself. And we would have a walk around campus, visit where all the venues were and what happened, and we'd discuss what went uh, right what uh, went wrong uh, and possibly why it went wrong. And uh, he would write all this down in his notebook in the, for next year. And it was actually during one of those uh, trips around that uh, I mentioned that, boy, four classes in a row, uh, back to back was really tough. Could we do a little break? And he says, hmm, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll talk about that at the board. So. Uh, they did, and next year we had a break, and what we uh, got uh, fed or put out were donuts. It wasn't until several years later that we went to uh, the melons. So donuts were the first uh, food at the breaks. So you are responsible for the fact that we have a morning break. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> Jack, Sometimes that's Jack my was, breakfast. If I sleep in after the after party, that's my breakfast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jack had been in the military. He was, I think by the time he retired from there, he was a colonel in the Army Reserve. Uh, and a, a few years, his summer camp <laughs> obligations conflicted with folk dance camp, and he had ended up charging in at the very last minute in full uniform. And I believe, if I remember correctly, when Bruce took over as director, Jack 
was not on campus that year because as a military commander, it was his belief that the, superior, the, the, the former officer or the former commander was not present so that the next person to come in would not be looking over their shoulder or wondering whether they were doing it right, which I think was a, an admirable thing to do. Madeline Green. Always humble. Yeah. The humble. She used to do this uh, bake off on how various women dance the hombo. That was my first year of camp. My goal was to learn the hombo. That was all I cared about that year. And she did, she was hysterical. She'd do the ballet dancer and all the others. I'm sure many more stories about her, but I didn't know her except for that one year. I do remember her uh, clowning around and doing these hombos, and we always had it. Uh, sometime during the week, uh, during the uh, Once Over Lightly, she would uh, do this demonstration of all the different people or the different women and how they did the hombo. And she was by herself, had no partner, and just in yeah. mind and all that. <laughs> I wonder if Drew Lester has ever seen it or heard about it, because I think she'd probably enjoy it as well. Okay, moving on. John Filsich. Mr. Colo. Originally was uh, partners with Ed Kremers. Festival records and uh, missed the first year of camp because he couldn't afford it. So, but came in the second year and has been there every year since. Didn't John marry one of the secretaries? Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. What? One of the camp secretaries? That's right. Yep. Well, my, my. Another camp romance. Ed <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kramer's. Ed Kramers and John had separate shops, rivals, and John kind of negotiated a hostile takeover after about a decade, but they did not start out together. <laughs> uh, Miriam Lister? And she taught at Stanford, and she and Dorothy Tamburini wrote a book called Folk Dance Progressions, and I think she was very influential in, in promoting folk dance in general. When she taught at camp, it was usually Israeli dancers. Yeah. Yeah. Gracie? Yes. She was very nice. Very forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the ukulele we have now. It's not for your feet. It's for some other part of your body that we don't know how to control very well. And again, you'll notice all the women are wearing skirts. They were not allowed to wear shorts. Not allowed. Now, all the stories about Ralph Page. Let's start with this one here. Well, I was not involved causing what you see right there, although I sure followed up what happened with it. As you see, he is in a laundry cart, which they had in the Southwest dorms at that time. Somebody went into his room, had to take the door off in order to get that laundry cart in the room. And of course, because we lived up on the second level, it was always a challenge for everybody to see if they could trap or get uh, him, you know, Ralph, wet when he opened the door. So Ralph always threw the door open so that glass of water over the door would not fall on them. And that night, when he opened the door, he found the laundry cart. And he went, and of course, in the, eventually, as you see a picture coming up, he was in the laundry cart and being pushed through that door. However, when he got out in the hallway, and Lawton came out of his room, and put his hands on his hips, didn't say a word. Everybody else disappeared, boom, like that. And here's Ralph in the laundry cart, all by himself. Wasn't uh, Lawton's room right below, uh, on the first floor, right below all of this? No, Lawton was on the second floor at that time. Lawton was? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I had a game in the hallway. <laughs> So he evidently had no qualms about dressing up for whatever occasion it was that we were doing. And he could call to just about anything, right, Bob? Absolutely. It was kind of a point of pride in a contest because people would come up with something off the wall with weird uh, time signatures, and he'd make it work somehow. Uh, this was a Chinese party, and at one point they would found a Chinese uh, instrumental piece that was definitely not standard contra fare, and Ralph called to it. Not true, not true. And Ralph he was around, from, he was around Ralph came for out from New Hampshire. years. 
Yeah, he came from New Hampshire, and there were a few years when uh, finances were a little tight, and Ralph couldn't, uh, we couldn't afford to have Ralph on the faculty. And every, all, each of those years when Ralph was back in New Hampshire during camp, he would send this gigantic wheel of Monterey Jack cheese. It must have been more than two foot in diameter. And uh, that was put, put out for everybody to sample. But uh, Ralph didn't want to be forgotten, and he sure wasn't. I think, isn't there a camp back east that uh, he established? Something junket yeah. or something? Oh, Northern Junket was his magazine. He had a magazine that he published called Northern Junket. Ah. What about the kitchen junket, Bruce? The kitchen junket? Well, the kitchen junket was something that took place at Stockton for about four years. And the reason it was only four years is because it took place in the evening. And they had two classes in the evening. And uh, from what, 8 o'clock, you know, until 10 o'clock. And uh, everybody went to the kitchen junket. And there were five other classes going on. But there were so many people at the kitchen junket, they finally had to say, well, we can't have that kitchen junket going on because nobody goes to other classes. And so but the four years they had, it was just a party. Because there were contras and squares, people playing instruments, singing, all that sort of stuff. And everybody just loved that party. Uh, Dick Crum came along pretty soon, and he was a, another great fixture with camp. He taught for many, many years and was, again, like John Filsich, primarily a circle dance teacher or non-partner teacher. And then he was <laughs> That's, yeah, he was a sweet man. This is a little later. <laughs> Hard to believe, huh? <laughs> And Beats. Beats was another fixture at camp. 23 years. I think he and uh, the Galts tied for the, that second position behind Jerry. Uh, I had a Bruce? magazine, uh, Viltus, that he uh, ran. Uh, taught a lot of dances from uh, places that were really strange to us, uh, like from India. I, I remember him several years doing dances from India, uh, different countries. Uh, very, very unique personality. As many dances were Lithuanian. Yeah, Lithuanian did the Lithuanian too. Yeah, that was that was his background. Yes, he uh, during those year, early years of camp, he had encountered uh, tuberculosis, and he spent a couple of years in the sanatorium before he was able to come back to camp. The year he came back to camp was my second year of folk dance camp, I believe. And right after dinner that year, he, I asked if he would teach me the Lithuanian polka. So we went up to one of our dance rooms called G200, and we spent about half an hour, and he bounced that sucker into me at that time. <laughs> I did learn it from him. And he, he wrote a book called Mr. Folk Dancer, which is a story of his life, which is, it's, a, it's charming in a lot of ways because it really talks about his early life in Lithuania before he left. It's, it's a wonderful book if you ever get a chance to read it or get a copy of it. It's, a, it's one you have to go to our library to get, I think. Mr. Mr. Jerry, what, 58 years he taught at camp, and there's so many stories about him, I don't even know where to start. Let's start first with how did, we, how did Jack McKay get him to camp in the first place? Well, I, I guess I can talk about that. Uh, Jerry told me that... Um, uh, Jack McKay saw him teaching squares at um, Asilomar, which is in Monterey, California. And uh, uh, Jack uh, came up to him and said, uh, we have this uh, folk dance camp, and I think you would be a good fit, and uh, we'd like you to uh, come to the camp. And Jerry says, well, uh, I don't want to go any folk dance thing. I'm a square dance caller, and uh, never, uh, I decline. So... Every time that Jerry came out to the West Coast, Jack would be at the uh, square dance and would uh, bug him about coming to folk dance camp. And finally, Jerry says, well, okay, I'll, I'll come one year, and that's it. But just leave me alone. So he came the first year and, of course, was a huge hit and uh, didn't want to come back. And I think, uh, Bob, you have a story on how your uh, father got him to come back? Well, sort of, yeah. He uh, made an offer for 
this Jerry to come back for his second year. And Jerry just said, I'll have to check my calendar. I'm not sure if I'm free. So a little later, Dad made another offer, up the ante a little bit, got the same answer from Jerry. I'm not sure. Let me check. And Dad figured Jerry was just trying to negotiate. So they went back for three or four times, and the eventual contract was more than twice what he started with. And turns out Jerry wasn't trying to negotiate. He really didn't know the schedule. But he managed to work it out, and he was there. And he had a requirement for an air conditioner in his contract. And a refrigerator, I understand. Mm. I don't remember so much the, the The important thing was the, the air, air conditioner. conditioner. That's, that's what he really insisted on having and uh, made his room popular for everybody. Afternoons, because, you know, in those days, there was nothing that was air conditioned. So the, the gym where we danced and the other rooms, uh, no air conditioning, no air conditioning in the dorms. So if you know, Stockton can get warm in the afternoons and uh, people would uh, either go outside or stop activities. And, uh, but Jerry always had this air conditioner. So uh, it was desirable to be uh, friends enough with Jerry to be able to get into the room in the afternoons. Gordon, what, how much uh, Stephanie store from here? Oh, to here? yeah. So in, in those days, uh, we always were in the same dorm, which was Southwest Dorm. And uh, the Southwest Dorm, the name comes from the first uh, dorm, our wing built there was called South Dorm. And then they built another one to the west of it. So then that complex became known as Southwest Dormitory. So Jerry always had the same room, which, by the way, uh, on one side of his room, uh, there was the uh, faculty lounge. Underneath was the office. And then I wound up uh, in the room next to him. That sort of isolated Jerry from any neighbors because there was generally noise coming from that room all hours of the night. And Jerry used to decorate the room with all kinds of artifacts and lights and uh, hangings on the wall and stuff. And, what he would do is, in the closet, he would dismantle the floorboards and take those up and put all of his stuff that he liked to keep and use the next year underneath in under the floorboards. Then he would put the floorboards back, and then next year his stuff would be right there ready for him to use. So uh, I, I'm pretty certain that there's still stuff <laughs> around the dorm that uh, Jerry hid that's probably still there. And there was a year that we, several people got together and got a weather balloon and stuck in his room and filled it full of air. So when Jerry opened his door, here's this weather balloon from ceiling to floors and walls. And of course, all he had to do was pop the sucker and it was done. But it, just those kind of things happen every year. Yeah. And, and so, Bruce, who was generally the ringleader in a lot of that stuff? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Well, statute of limitations run out, so, you know, fess up. I, I heard a story from Howard Young when he was on uh, the crew that you, Gordon, said to him, we got to take Jerry's refrigerator up to his room. And Howard said something like, wait, you, know, you can't have door, you can't refrigerators. It would just blow the circuits if everybody had a refrigerator. And you just smiled and said, well, Jerry gets a refrigerator. Come on. And he yeah. lugged that sucker up three, you know, whatever, two floors up to Jerry's room because Jerry got a refrigerator. So for 50 umpteen years, he was the king of the roost. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Had his refrigerator and had his air conditioner. Yeah. And the power to the building was uh, not strong enough to uh, take air conditioners and or refrigerators in every room. So... Jerry got one, but everybody else didn't. But eventually, they upgraded the power. And we used to haul up refrigerators to all the rooms yeah. that wanted to rent one. And it was our job to place the refrigerators in the room. And then after, because on campus, they uh, rented the uh, refrigerators out. There was a little store that had them on campus. And you, if you wanted one, you can go and rent one. I don't know, it was like 7 $8 for a week. And you could rent this uh, refrigerator, but then get into the room and 
the job came down to me, and as Ed Howard said, uh, him, and we used to haul all these refrigerators up, and no elevators, so we had to carry them up the, to the rooms. So there's, this was uh, coming from Cincinnati with a, friend, a unique freshness of style and enthusiasm. Um, I brought this up to show what life, the schedule was like in 1955. Uh, we frequently complain today because, oh my goodness, we have three classes to choose from and we have four in the morning. It's awful. It's terrible. So here was a time when we had six, seven classes to choose from, never less than five between eight o'clock rise and noon. And then, in case you're wondering what happened between noon and 8.30, this is when they had all kinds of uh, sit sessions and assemblies and lawn parties and all kinds of other stuff. And then we had more formal classes uh, up eight, late into the evening. But you can see what, here's Bob No Oro being taught in 1955. There's, a, there's a three pages. They got all the schedule out in one day, so you can see everything. Plan your schedule. Billion. Oh. And this is something that a lot of people aren't aware that these even exist. Uh, there is a, an index card for every person who's ever attended Stockton, with a few exceptions. There are some people that, for whatever reason, got skipped, and we haven't been able to find their cards. But this is the one for John Filsich, which points out he's got an X on all the other years, first and second, first and second, but nothing for 1948. And I think when I showed these slides the first time, and Denise said, Really? There's one for me? And there's the Denise's. <laughs> we still use them. Yeah, they're still updated every year. This one, I think they only go through, my copy only goes through 2014. And this is Gordon's with all his address changes. They never bother to update it. They always use the same one. So it's like, uh, you know, it, it's a historical record of everything that happened at camp for you. First and second week forever. All your phone numbers. Look at that. Sorry. So if anybody anybody wants to see, you can text me and I'll uh, I'll find your card. And I want you to notice here that this is uh, he was at one point married to Cookie Mitchell. Does that name sound familiar? <laughs> so at one point, this is Bruce's sister. So Gordon and Bruce were brothers-in-law. How's that for a situation? Well, wait, there's more. <laughs> wait, there's more. What, what would that be? Well, I do believe that uh, uh, Denise and Bruce may have been married for a while. Well, that's why it oh, sounds wow. get other years from Mitchell card. Yeah. So, oh, <laughs> from Mitchell card. <laughs> so she's listed on the Mitchell card as well. Ah. Uh. And my first year, my last name was Gill. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I get around. <laughs> you get around. This is my card. I've only been there a mere 20 for five years. I, I'm, not, I'm a youngster compared to all you guys. And only one at two address changes. Not bad. Okay, so let's talk about going up to Murphy's. When folk dance camp started for quite a few years, it was started on Monday and was over on Saturday, leaving a Sunday, nothing happening. And during that middle Sunday between the two weeks, there was a trip to, up to Murphy's. And that was up into the Gold Rush country. And in this particular area also had jumping frogs right next to that same area. And uh, it cost $5 to go on this trip. When they got up to Murphy's Creek, the uh, Murphy's Quadrille Club, which this is the creek right here, provided a steak, barbecue steak dinner for us. That was just a, a treat on them. They paid for that. All you're paying for was a bus trip. And then it went from here to the dance hall on the Kenny Ranch. This is the dance hall itself. You can see the Murphy's Quad Drill Club sign up there. They always had some frogs they brought in, and people got to experience the jumping frogs. And this is an example right here. This particular one, the jumping frogs, you, after we did, no longer went to Murphy's, but the folks would bring the frogs to Callison Hall, and this is where this is taking place many years later. So they had the experience of that part of, of anyhow. I think I probably got to all of those. The joys of being in the cool water of that creek was pretty attractive to a whole lot of people. That came straight down from the mountains. So my first year, 
I think was the last year they had the trip to uh, Murphy's. And the thing I uh, remember best about it was uh, Bruce got so mad because Uzi Martin uh, hit his shoes in a garbage can or something, <laughs> and he just had an absolute fit. It was my dance shoes for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Never did think, find them either. I think that previous picture was Moshiko. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's Moshiko. Yeah. Many years later. Later, he didn't come to town for quite a while, so I knew this wasn't at Murphy's, but they brought the, the frogs in to, uh, to yeah. celebrate that anyway, just to show what it was like. That's in Callison. Yeah. So there was a lot of stuff that went on in the pool because it was close, not like it is now. We're across campus from the pool now. Um, but in those days, it, it was close to get to the pool, and they spent a lot of time in the pool. Late at night, they had contras in the pool, so you could still do a right-hand star and ladies chain and swing your partner I imagine was a lot of fun and they had outdoor parties and I might, we might recognize a few of these people here's Bruce this is Ed Kremers up here Jerry's over here with Kathy behind him and Dr. Jay's down here with his scarf on his head can't leave off the scarf did I miss anybody that you guys know Oh, and this Armin guy. Trout, right Armin Trout. And uh, there was something about this pool, Gordon. Well, it was, uh, so in those days, well, not, uh, this is uh, before me, but uh, a little bit later, um, when I was at uh, camp and uh, I would go on campus and Jack and, and or Lot would hand me a roll of keys and say, here, here's the keys, and if I need something, go to this room and get it. So I had master keys for just about everything, including the gymnasium that we danced in, and uh, the keys went through the locker room to the pool. So as it turned out, uh, it was possible to have uh, private parties at the pool late at night, uh, which occurred uh, quite a bit. It was nice because it was sort of bermed up. So if you got into the pool, then you couldn't be seen from the uh, roadway. The, uh, so the cops going by couldn't see you. So you had to be careful to watch out for the cops. So you're the one who did that, huh? <laughs> I'm not saying you know, anything more about it. And there was, it used to be a midnight swim. Like yeah. once that was the other pool. Yeah. That really? Was they built, you never had it. It in was this a, pool? when they built the other pool. That's the current pool now. They did it both yeah. pools. This is the old pool. They yeah. Doing both. They did both. Yeah. Pools. I remember on the uh, uh, midnight swim, we had the with the new pool, and they had a uh, a viewing room down <laughs> below that you could go down and you could watch people swim, and and some young guy some teenage boy dove in and lost his trucks. You got the fickle foot for that, too. With, with uh, uh, quite a few observers. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is just an interesting little skit that must have gone on. Uh, again, the women were not allowed to, allowed to wear pants in those days, except for very special occasions like this. I'm imagining that Jack McKay here was going to call a square, and he had everybody switch parts. So we have... Dick Crum, and Bruce, and Jerry, and anybody recognize this guy? Sonny? Is that Sonny? Ooh, I don't know. I, Sonny Newman? I don't think so, but maybe. And this was one of the early lawn parties. I think this was from 57, but they were a main fixture at camp, a way to be outdoors and relatively cool if it was a shady space. Uh, Jerry's over here in the corner, and he's calling a square. And what else was going on with the, the lawns those, in those years? Well, one thing is that a lot of people from the uh, community would come over and just uh, have their chairs, and they'd sit there and watch the lawn party. You can see the road behind. Uh, that road no longer exists. That was taken out. Uh, to the right side of this picture were the uh, southwest dorm. 
and that's where we stayed, and this was a big lawn area. And then on the left-hand side was a thing called the end zone. That was a little uh, coffee shop that was on campus. And the, uh, they used to water the lawns to the point where you couldn't yeah. dance on them. They well, flood them. Well, the watering system was uh, flood irrigation. So around okay. the lawn area was a little berm. So the way they had water is they would just uh, pump in water from the delta and uh, just flood the lawn. And then, of course, that would soak back into the uh, soil and then again run right out to the uh, delta. So it, would, uh, it was great fun because in the afternoons, if there was nothing else going on, you could uh, sort of uh, play a little game of slipping and sliding. Yeah, slip and slide. Yes. Fun. Bob said that the university had its own well. Well, yeah. I, well, I, I think they also were able to pump because they're right next to the delta here. So. So we have the assembly in the afternoon. Yeah, we used to do that in the auditorium. And it was the coolest place on campus. So it was well attended. It was also a nice place to uh, catch up on your sleep. So you yeah, they'd usually in be in the back row here and they would be snoring. I think I have some individual pictures of some people snoring in that back aisle. <laughs> people used to bring pillows. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and a lot, I think that in one of the books I read about early Stockton, they had a list of some of the topics and that were just, that were brought out in these lectures. And they were, they're like the culture corners we have now, there were just a wide variety of, of topics and discussions and demonstrations. And after the assembly was? Yeah, on Thursdays. Yeah. Uh, watermelon feed. And you could see that uh, we were a little lacking in maybe watermelon hygiene. We would just <laughs> put them on the lawn and just with a knife uh, cut them up into slices and people would come over and pick them up right off the lawn and eat the uh, watermelon. We used to go through quite a few watermelons. It was a very popular event. Well, it's, it was after the assembly. They just woken up from their nap and they needed to perk their right, eyes, right. perk up their taste buds a little bit. Mr. But that went up into the, the. It started out, if my history was correct, the watermelon feed was started by the the people that had the magazine. So the editor of Let's Dance magazine, uh, Beats, who did Viltish. Uh, Ralph Page did uh, Northern Junket. Um, and Bob Osborne did Sets in Order. Yeah, there was a bunch of people that uh, the folk dance scene, the folk dancer, there were a bunch of them, and they all got together and bought the watermelons. And that lasted a couple of years, and then they decided they couldn't afford to do it anymore. And the dealers took it over. And the dealers ranged, we'll see pictures of them later. There are a lot of different dealers, and they paid for the watermelons. And then when the dealer said they didn't want to do it anymore, Camp took it over. And at some point, I think it was because Ray Bacon was in charge of it. And when he stopped coming to camp, there was nobody to cut up the watermelons. Until I said, I'm reviving the watermelon feed and we're going to have watermelon. So the last two years we had a watermelon feed and we had, I think, I think we went through two watermelon. It was not the popular event and it was right after lunch. So people had just eaten lunch anyway. But it was a, it was a big deal to That's have the, uh, the watermelon feed. That's Steve Katansky, in case you were wondering. He may have been giving that assembly. And that's Ralph Page. Heck, okay, in those so, days, they'd go through 20 or 30 melons. Yeah, well, not anymore. But in those days, it, I'm sure it was a much more popular thing. Everybody went. And they, they, it was kind of a trapped uh, bunch of people because they just came out of the assembly. So the committee, it wasn't a board at the time, were the people that ran the camp, so to speak. So I, I found a whole folder that Marge uh, Smith put together of the committee pictures. So this was not the very first, but very early on. This is from 55. So um, <coughs> uh, A. Smith and Vera Holifer and Lawton and Mildred. What happened with Mildred? Mildred Bueller's husband worked for Bank of America and he got transferred to London, which seemed like a long commute for camp. So we lost Mildred. That's too bad because she was a she was a fixture at camp. I saw a lot of pictures of her. This was in 1955. The board has enlarged. Lucille Charnovsky, Lawton, Vera Holifer. Somebody help me with his name. George Merton. 
George Merton, A. Smith, Jack McKay, and Walter Grothe. And Jack is in uniform in that picture. He is yeah. indeed. And we're up to, this is 79, uh, Ace, Bruce has joined the board, Bev Wilder, John Pappas, which we'll see more of later, Walter, Jan Wright, who is, uh, she's been in camp forever, Ruth Ruling, Jack McKay, and Vera Holifer. Okay, so now we've got uh, Jeff O'Connor, who would eventually become our third director. He's on the board now. And I think everybody fourth. else uh, is fourth. The, fourth. Oh, am I, the fourth I director. I, all right, now we're up to 79, and we have added Gordon. Jeff is still on the board. Denise is here. Many of the other faces are the same. Ruth Rowling. We have our first color picture of the board. We've added uh, Bobby Ashley and Suzanne Roca Butler and Dave Ugla. I think this picture was taken in uh, Jack McKay's backyard. In 1990, it says 1998. On, it was in the 1998 folder. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the board members. Let me run back through so you can take another look quickly just to peruse, see how big and, and vibrant and all the people that were involved that made camp happen year after year after year. And I, we should get around to doing a board picture this year. But when, we, when we're all, maybe we can do it on Zoom. Next time we have a Zoom meeting, we'll take a picture of the Zoom screen. <laughs> so in 1957, I believe that's what year this was, we have the price of camp. Still not very expensive. Uh, $60 in 1957 was a lot of bucks. I, I agree, but to look back now, I think, huh, that's nothing. This is what camp looked like in 57, the size. I'm not going to go through who was there and all mm -hmm. of the, you know, zooming in, but that's the, how big the camp was in 57. 